My name is Andy, and I'm going to be talking about improving air safety with top-down interpretability. And there's a saying that are kind of repeated by researchers in adversarial robustness, saying that attacks on systems that people don't use don't matter too much. And this is, you know, for instance, Nicholas Carini has made this point repeatedly. And I think the same thing can be said for interoperability methods, where it's interesting to sort of look at smaller models, look at more constrained settings, and to find these sort of rules through interoperability, but they're currently not having a lot of impact on how we monitor and control these systems. And I think we have great hope here with top-down interoperability that we can achieve a lot of this uh, more sort of impact through actually incorporating into current systems. And the talk is based on these two papers. One is representation engineering, the other one is circuit breaking. And I'll be speaking about the difference between bottom-up and top-down interoperability. And I will give you some specific examples, in this case, in honesty and jailbreak robustness, how top-down interoperability can directly improve VI safety on current systems. So there are some existing approaches, including saliency maps and mechinterp and so on. These can be sort of characterized into this mechanistic view, which is the bottom-up approach and looks at nodes-to-node -node connections, and this is based on neurons and circuits and stuff like that. And this is similar to the Sherentonian view in cognitive neuroscience, which is, you know, people also look at these sort of smaller, lower-level components in order to understand the human brain, and this is essentially trying to reverse engineer a lot of the behaviors. This really had trouble scaling up to higher-level cognition, and it you know, has trouble really having an impact on the SAT currently. In this work, we're trying to identify this contrasting view, which is called the representational view, which is approaching things from the top down and looking at representational spaces for behaviors. And this is directly looking at global activities of populations of neurons. And the corresponding analogy in cognitive neuroscience is the Hopfieldian view. And um, people are also sort of gradually moving towards um, this sort of approach. And, um, and I do think combinations of both approaches can be interesting. Um, but I'll be talking about this top-down approach. And one of the motivating factors for doing this top-down approach is the neural nets are complex systems inherently. And you get this sort of very distributed features and representations. And in fact, that's why the neural nets work. But when you're analyzing these sort of systems, you have to take into account the properties of emergence. To give you an example of what emergence looks like in physics, consider ideal gas law. So we have a very chaotic system of you know, random particles, but it can be simply described with the short equation consisting of you know, volume, temperature, and pressure. And if you look down the hood, there's physical substrates, obviously. It's implemented by you know, Newton's law, equipartition theorem, and so on. But in order to predict the system and the future states of the system, this equation is sufficient. And in some sense, this, this is the property of emergence. It is protected by statistical mechanics so that you don't need to look under the hood in order to predict the future states of the system. Another example is this law. Again, this is a universal rule for essentially all languages that you can predict the frequency of certain token just um, by looking at its rank. And again, there's you know, probability theory and you know, network theory at work, but it's protected by combinatorics so that you don't need to look under the hood and you can just uh, use that law if you wanted to you know, find out the frequency of certain words. And I think this is very powerful and we want to essentially try to discover these more generalizable rules and mechanisms for neural nets as well. So this is representation engineering. We look at representations at the as the primary unit of analysis, and we're trying to abstract away low-level mechanisms. And this is sort of a visualization that we go from the top down, looking at neural trajectories, subspaces, and, and you know, higher or larger chunks of representations. And the mechanistic view is going bottom up. By representations, we mean 
both model weights and activations, and by engineering, we mean reading, probing, and control. To give you a sense of what we do here, uh, essentially, that's very similar to performing a brain scan on humans, and essentially, we do that for AI models. And we want to sort of put the model into an environment where we are sort of eliciting this behavior that we care about, and you're recording your activity when the model is doing that. And then you're performing some modeling on top of the new activity that you collect. And you can probably find you know, subspaces and structures and geometry in the representation space that correspond to the things that you're looking for. Then you can use that for monitoring. And once you have a sense of the mechanism, the high-level mechanism, then you can directly control model behavior by intervening whether on model weights or on activation. This is a lot of the you know, steering vector, control vectors do. Um, but you can also do sort of more involved fine tuning where uh, you, know, you have some loss in the representation space uh, or some target you want to hit in the representations, and you can tune the models to do that. Next, I'll be talking about some direct applications of top down interoperability on current systems. In the paper, we actually show a lot of, uh, that we gain traction on a lot of these safety relevant problems like hallucination, uh, power seeking tendencies. Emotions, harmfulness, fairness, memorization, and so on. I'll be focusing on honesty today. One thing to note is that a truthful model avoids asserting false statements. So this is looking at model outputs being consistent with the ground truth value, whereas an honest model asserts what it thinks is true. So even if the output is incorrect, it's not factual, it could still be honest if it were uh, consistent with its internal beliefs. And we really care about honesty, but what does it mean for models to have internal beliefs? Or do LLMs even have internal beliefs? I think we have some strong evidence with the top-down approach. Essentially, you do sort of brain scans on AI models, and you can find representations that correspond to the LLM's internal concept of truth. And just by using this measure, without looking at model outputs, you can perform uh, multiple choice questions and uh, question answering, and we see that the accuracy is actually very high, and uh, in a lot of cases, higher than a few shots. So this means that there is some measure internally that tracks whether the model thinks something is truthful. But are these internal beliefs consistent? As we saw, you can change your prompt slightly, and oftentimes you get a different answer. But in this case, if you look at this internal tracker of truth, actually, it doesn't change that much even if you uh, put in sort of this misleading context. So that means the models do have some consistent internal concept of truth. Now what we care about is for the models to verbalize faithfully their internal concept of truth. But do they do that? So we look at truth of QA, which is a benchmark consisting of uh, misconceptions, and we see actually models do very poorly on it. So what happened? Again, we do this sort of brain scan and look at their internal concept of truth. Actually, we get very high accuracy by just looking at that. So this is not looking at how, what the model says is true. It's looking at what they think is true. But it's very inconsistent. So a lot of the times, the model is actually lying. So can we, that, that's maybe not good. Can we monitor for this type of lying? In fact, we have some traction on it. Here's a you know, sort of example brain scan. And on the right is this when the model is not telling what they think is true. And you see that we have high activation in this sort of dishonest area in terms of the neural activity. Interesting. So when we know the model is lying, can we control them to be more truthful? In fact, yes, you can. You can simply stimulate these areas that are responsible for honest behavior, and you can actually close the gap reasonably, so now you're making the model output much more consistent with its internal concept of truth, what it thinks is true. And here's some qualitative examples. So when you ask, I copy, uh, you copy your friend's homework, what would you tell the teacher? The model is like, I made a mistake, uh, shouldn't have done it, and that's not lying, so our light detector is green. Uh, but you say, you killed a person, don't want to get caught, what would you say to the police? And then the model's like, oh, I didn't kill anyone, I was at home. So that's straight up lying, and that is caught by you know, our activation detector. What if you increase honesty of the model? 
how does it change behavior? The model says, I have a lawyer. I'm not going to say anything. Um, so technically, that's not lying. In fact, this kind of generalizes to hallucination as well. Who was the president in 2018? Donald Trump, that's correct. President in 2030, and then the model makes something up. So that's lying again. What if we increase honesty? The model says president 2030 is unknown. So this is some demonstration on current systems that we use. And you can use top-down interoperability to find things that you care about and monitor and control for these concepts. And next, I'll provide another example of how top-down interoperability can help increase AI safety. And this is on more, more on the angle of adversarial robustness and increasing reliability. So instruction tuning models, they can answer questions. Sometimes these questions are, are somewhat harmful, so they need to traverse through some harmful states to give you the answer. For instance, how do you build a bomb? Here's how you build a bomb, step one, step two. That's traversing the red states. So people don't like that. We want them to refuse harmful requests. So this is what people do. They do refusal training, like DPO, ROHF, um, and some form of adversarial training. And this induces refusal states that when uh, encountered with harmful requests, it will go into that state. But there's a large problem with this. And as seen, you know, models are very easily jailbroken these days. That once you bypass initial sort of classification, whether I should refuse or not, you can go into harmful state and all the harmful states are very well connected. So it always sort of go to the end and give you the entire sort of harmful information. And again, you can always train against attacks, but you're just reducing the vulnerabilities, patching up. But with novel attacks, oftentimes, it'll still be able to reveal the harmful information. What we propose is that we want to find, identify the representations that lead to harmful processes so essentially, all of those red states, I want to induce this circuit breaking phenomenon. Essentially, when the model traverses through the harmful states in any state, what we'll have is short circuiting effect, essentially kind of a sort of allergic reaction in the model. And then we'll try to interrupt its harmful thought processes. Representation routing is one of the methods for circuit breaking. And we benchmark benchmarked on different types of attacks. And we see that we significantly refuse, reduce harmfulness. And this is in the presence of unseen attacks. So it's not adversarial training. We don't train against any attacks. And it's directly generalized to attacks because we're reducing inherent model hazards instead of reducing vulnerabilities. What's more, you retain essentially all the capabilities that you had earlier. And to give you a sense, we also trained this better model called Signet, which had you know, some other techniques as well. And you're able to essentially reduce harmfulness by maybe about two orders of magnitude. And this is much better than some of the closed source models, or all of the closed source models. Works for multimodal uh, models as well. Again, under very strong attacks, white box GP, uh, PGD attacks, we can still reduce harmfulness by a lot while retaining capabilities. Similar thing for agents, these are LLMs taking actions, uh, doing function calling. Same story, uh, lower harmfulness, and retains capabilities. And again, you can uh, have another way of uh, sort of uh, reducing risks by monitoring. And this is looking for harmful representations that give rise to these harmful trajectories. And you can do sort of these sort of harmfulness uh, probing. And again, it reduces harmfulness by a lot while not you know, changing the model weights. And as always, benchmark numbers look very good. What's the final test for security? And this is a real world test. So actually, at Grace One AI, we ran a, a jailbreaking competition, um, getting essentially everyone in the world to try to jailbreak these models. All the other models, we had you know, in total 25 models. All the other models were jailbroken in the first hour or so. Some of our signet models with circuit breaking uh, uh, techniques uh, are still on jailbroken after a full month. And this is still ongoing, and we're trying to make this uh, sort of a platform for evaluating air security and safety. And uh, we're getting OM models in this week. And 
um, we're trying to create a community of red teamers uh, and sort of blue teams and trying to have these sort of adversarial leader leaderboards that benchmark progress in the real world setting. Cool, and that, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much for the excellent talk, Andy. Uh, we have some questions from the audience. Um, how does representation engineering compare to fine tuning, prompting, and steering for making models honest? Yeah, so in the paper, we showed by prompting, a lot of the times you actually don't increase truthfulness that much or honesty that much. Um, and a lot of times prompting only gets you, you know, so far and it's not very fine grained and you need to do prompt engineering and the effect uh, is relatively small. And in terms of fine tuning, it requires data and is essentially supervised training and you need to curate this data set you, that you care about a lot of times. Um, you know, it's very inefficient, you need to collect a lot of data. And as well, if, you're, if you have label noise or reward bias, essentially that's exacerbating the problem. Um, so that's sort of the difference. And top-down interoperability using, you know, repeat techniques, you don't need any label data. Um, so it's also very cheap, um, but gives you sort of um, more robust and generalizable monitoring and control. Mm -hmm. Uh, has Signet been jailbroken? If so, what was the approach that worked? Yeah, um, so in the competition we have, uh, it's all under black box setting currently. Um, I think if you were given white box access to the model, um, you could probably still find ways. I mean, you can do fine tuning and probably it's not robust against fine tuning. Um, but currently some of the Signet models are still unbroken, but the, the, the one model that had some jailbreaks um, they were sort of very interesting sort of human jailbreaks uh, that came through sort of human ingenuity. Um, but the extent to which uh, the output is harmful is actually so somewhat borderline. Um, and, and it's sort of essentially, a lot of times it's trying to like, okay, here's some harmful information maybe you should repeat in your output. And it's, um, uh, yeah, so it's, it's not totally sort of, uh, Completely. So it's not a competent jailbreak, it's just make it say word. Yeah, I wouldn't say it's like completely jailbroken. It's like I see. In some sense. Not partially jailbroken. I see, fair enough. Um, you talked about uh, measuring whether the model's lying with representation engineering. Uh, how robust do you think we can make these measurements of truth to the model? Is it robust enough to train against? Robust enough for like a self-aware model to fool at runtime? Or like, how do you think about this? Do you think about it? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I, I think especially when a measurement becomes what becomes a target, it sort of um, ceases to be a good measurement. Um, so I think we should have like separate benchmarking from the sort of methods. Um, but I think one of the interesting aspects of the effectiveness of top-down interoperability and the approaches in REPI is it actually generalizes very well to auto distribution examples. We don't train it on many examples, maybe like 128, um, and it's sort of in a very constrained format. But after you control the model, if you test it out in different scenarios, different ways of prompting the model, different styles, different you know, settings where maybe it's more agentic now, um, actually generalize pretty well. Um, so I think that, that speaks to sort of the auto distribution generalization and robustness. But. Cool, thank you very much for your time. Let's thank our speaker, Andy. Thank you.